Good evening, all. And so while I, uh, Patty will share the slides, but I wanted to start out by saying what, for my part, what I will share tonight is um, our elementary hybrid and limited in-person timeline, as well as uh, kind of spotlight what our enrollment looks like to date with our families choosing either hybrid or 100% online. And then uh, Director Fields will share uh, our secondary plan around limited in-person and the um, cafe engagement. And so what we shared at, uh, what I shared at the last board meeting was that for elementary, which includes pre-K, we decided on a hybrid model that was a half day model. And hybrid is half day in person, and then the other half um, um, online learning. And so looking here at our timeline, I've included um, the waves of uh, vaccination, COVID vaccination that our staff and other employees and started in wave one was our pre-K to one staff, which also included our custodians, our front office workers, bus drivers, nutrition staff. And then again, after that uh, was wave two, which uh, included our second through uh, fifth grade certified, classified, our specialist counselors, and those staff in second through fifth grade that have direct support to students. So by our staff getting the opportunity to receive COVID vaccines with the one, uh, two doses, and then um, two weeks after that, allowed us to set a target date to bring back our uh, students from instruction. So if you look at the timeline, that for pre-K to one, that means that our students, our pre-K pre one students will start uh, on March the 29th. That's the week uh, after spring break. With the one week transition for our second through fifth graders starting in April, um, on April 5th. And before that, uh, the week before spring break, our uh, pre-K to five staff who are who will be teaching in hybrid will be coming in to the buildings. That will give them an opportunity to continue teaching um, in CDL while also preparing uh, the classrooms to be ready to receive our students on the 29th. You also see on this timeline, um, the other waves for our uh, middle and high school staff uh, to receive uh, vaccines. Uh, we have started on uh, wave three, but that is not yet complete. And um, we have not started wave four for vaccinating our uh, high school staff, which includes student teachers, coach, coaches, and other district staff. And that's the final uh, wave. But what you do see is that uh, we have limited in-person instruction for a small group of students that for uh, various reasons are not engaged in um, CDL or for students who need more specialized services and or for students who need uh, Tier, uh, tier support that has already started. And so you see on the timeline, we started um, with a small group of elementary students who needed some specialized services, as well as we started this week with um, middle, middle level and um, our uh, Creekside uh, High School started limited in person. And you'll hear more about uh, our high school limited in person. So the next slide, I would like to share with you what I shared last time. This is the hybrid schedule. It is a half day uh, cohorts A and B. And with um, 
students receiving instruction in math and reading in person, and then um, asynchronous instruction either in the morning or afternoon that includes um, work independently. And then the next slide. This is a snapshot of uh, data that we've collected uh, to date of our families who have shared with us their intent to either go to the hybrid model or schedule and or stay in 100% online. And as you can see, um, it is broken down in racial demographics. Uh, the data is showing that the majority of our families today um, are choosing 100% online as compared to uh, our hybrid. And then the no change from the fall is just that our families have not yet decided. Our deadline for uh, choosing either hybrid or 100% um, online is midnight tonight. So families still have opportunities to uh, choose or you'll see the no change. So Dr. Lee, yes. um, so, so, yeah, so of the um, 4,362, if you do not hear from them by midnight tonight, then whether they chose CDL or hybrid should stick, right? So if, yes. if they, okay, half of them were hybrid, they would drop into the hybrid column. Okay. Yes, and All that right. is for the remainder of the year. Okay. We Again, this data doesn't tell us the complete story of uh, what our families are having to navigate. And we feel for them because we know that for what, you know, there's reasons that families choose either or that could be based on childcare, having to work. Um, what I've heard from some of our principals, families are communicating, some families are communicating to them that they're wanting to stay the course for consistency of schedule. Uh, we heard a lot of families during the uh, school community meetings who had questions about wanting to keep their same teacher. That was a real concern for some of our families, as well as a uh, concern about student safety and is it safe to go back in, during the pandemic? And those are real concerns. There are challenges and barriers. But what I can tell you is that our principals and support staff, through the support of our basic needs teams and our family partnership advocates, they're getting those stories. They're listening to our families and, and hearing some of the barriers to um, either our model. And just like our families are having to make these difficult choices, so are our staff who also have children, some of our staff who have children in TTSD. And those are some real concerns. So, um, you know, we'll continue to give you updates. Again, like I said, this is data we, uh, thanks to Susan Bernard, who uh, pulled the, this data for us and we're able to share it tonight, but we will, um, Keep you updated. Can I? And, can I? Have, go ahead. Direct just a, a clarifying question here. So, of the of the four thousand three hundred sixty-two, do you do we what what's the current breakdown of hundred percent online versus hybrid? Uh, as to where they, well, it, it's either on another slide, and I can sh that should be a link. I can get that link to you showed where they moved from either hybrid um, to online, but I don't have that on this slide here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lisa. Susan. If I may help there for just a moment. Um, the 4362, that does include parents who have responded. It just, they haven't changed their mind. So we mm -hmm. haven't heard from everybody. Um, yeah. It's definitely growing and it was 25% last Thursday, and now it's well over 60%. Um, so I just want to make some clarification that that 4362 includes parents that have also responded back 
in uh, uh, exactly what Dr. McCall said that if they don't let us know, we'll keep them with what their choice was in the fall. And then the breakdown of our percentages of 100% online versus hybrid from the fall was 25%. And I will see if I can get the number for you at least at this moment in time by at the end of the presentation, just to give you an update of where we're, we're leaning towards. Thank you, uh, Director Bernard. Is there any questions from the board on, on this one slide? Other questions? So just to make sure I understand, um, Director Bernard, uh, so 20, what you're saying is right now to about 25% of our families want the hybrid model, 75%. Is that what I'm understanding? I guess I'm a little confused. Sure. Um, <laughs> let's talk about which time frame we're talking about. From the fall, when we asked parents this question, we landed around a quarter of our families went 100% online. I will get that number as of now, given that parents still have a little bit of time to see what that trend looks like. It's definitely higher for 100% online based on Dr. Lisa's slide here that more people are sliding over to the 100% online. Um, and we have the majority of our staff, our parents have responded to the survey. Um, and I just, so I just wanted to clear up that it wasn't 4,000 that haven't responded. They just haven't changed their mind. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. As, yeah, when we start throwing around percentages, I start getting confused about what we're at. So thank you. Yeah. Any more questions on the, um, this data? Okay. So as our, our, um, our principals and their staff are continuing to hear the stories of our families uh, and what they need, we, uh, with our, our CARES funding, as you know, we have partnered with Club K and YMCA. And so we have those on-site childcare and those sites currently they are uh, at or nearing capacity at the five locations. So that's the indication of the need for childcare. And um, there's uh, a few more slots available, but again, like I said, those uh, sites are uh, near capacity. So our next slide is just the next steps in, in our uh, work around uh, pre-K to five. Uh, this week, our, uh, we're still surveying our pre-K families regarding their choice, and we'll have that data later this week. Uh, but for, uh, like I said, families have up until midnight tonight. We are also uh, starting limited in-person instruction uh, starting on the 16th in a number of our elementary schools. And again, that is a small group that will continue up to March, uh, right the week right before March the 9th, and then we'll transition to hybrid. That does not mean that we will not provide support when we are in hybrid or seek out how we can best support our families who choose to stay 100% uh, online. We have a um, pre-K to five scheduling team collaborative that meets uh, weekly and that has a uh, diverse representation from uh, our administrators, uh, our association reps, as well as classified staff, transportation, and we uh, will continue to tweak and analyze data and monitor how things are going, as well as uh, um, discuss alignment between our CDL and our hybrid models. And then we will continue to uh, prepare for possible adjusting in our grading practices as we transition. So um, next I invite Director Amber Fields to share with us um, opportunities that we have, we have for a secondary limited in person, person as well as what we're calling um, our engagement cafe. So with that, I turn it over to Director Fields. Dr. Lisa, can I ask one question before we move off of this slide? Sure. Um, 
So is it the goal or expectation that a student in the 100% um, um, virtual and a student hybrid model will have the exact same number of instructional hours in both experience or not necessarily? Uh, not, not necessarily, but in experience, they are so, they are so similar. Yeah. So, but we're not concerned about not meeting instructional hour um, requirements re regardless of what, what the hybrid model uh, now is the minutes are similar to what it was, be, uh, what it is now, the asynchronous and the synchronous. So that hasn't really changed that much. Any other questions from the board or our student reps? So next, um, Director Fields. Hello again, everyone. Next slide, mm -hmm. please. So secondary Lippy or limited in-person instruction. Um, I just wanted to anchor us back into what we've prioritized K-12, which is really Lippy is about engaging students that have not been able to engage in CDL. And so these are been our priority using our MTSS data, driving what students are needing that additional support to just access CDL and above and beyond just from a technology perspective. Um, that's needing that caring adults and that support, that kind of in-person cheerleader to be accessing CDL. So just to clarify, Lippy is not about direct instruction. It's about engaging students in their CDL courses. Um, and some of the limitations we're currently working within is that we all know that we're on volunteer staff only. And I just wanna take a moment, Director uh, Zershmeet, I appreciate your comment before. We are so grateful to those that are choosing to volunteer and also grateful for those waiting for vaccination. We've tried to be really clear. There is not a pressure to volunteer right now. Um, you know, teachers and staff are in a really hard spot where they are having to, you know, sort of weigh that ethical dilemma between their own health and their family's health and their deep passion for serving students. And so we just want to keep bringing that in the space that, you know, it is volunteer at this point. Um, and we absolutely respect and support those waiting until vaccination. Um, but working on volunteer staff only, which has been challenging um, just to identify a large enough um, number of staff that are also not teachers because they are tied to a bell schedule and CDL or a Lippy cannot interrupt CDL. Uh, we're at about two buses per school um, and that capacity is driven by the transportation that will be needed for our elementary program to run when they roll out their half day. Uh, no more than 20 students and no more than two hours at a time. So we've had to be really thoughtful about our time frame so that we're not traveling students during their class times, but we're getting there, more, there right before. They can stay on campus two hours. We're transporting home at lunch and bringing the next group in at lunch. Um, so what we've got going on is our, what we're calling engagement cafes. Um, and again, it's around engaging in CDL. So our middle school engagement cafes launched this week. Uh, Fowler and Tuality started today and Hazelbrook will be launching on Thursday. Uh, Tigard and Tualatin High School will be launching, launching their engagement cafes the week of February 15th. And some of our student groups have adjusted based on our staff availability. Um, so as Principal Bailey and Delerba mentioned earlier, there's a focus on our seniors and around credit recovery in these first groups. Um, and we'll absolutely be looking to expand as vaccinations uh, continue to be completed for secondary staff. At Creekside, they have previously launched a one-on-one -on -one student support uh, limited in person and will ex be expanding with engagement courses this week, which is pretty exciting. They're gonna be doing some night courses as an engagement strategy, as well as uh, additional engagement cafe and courses beginning the week of February 15th. Director Fields, can I, um, I just wanna to touch on something that you just said. So the, sure. the schedule that Dr. McCall showed us in one of her initial slides. So we anticipate that rollout of vaccinations for secondary to continue as it has for our, our first rollout of one and two, correct? Yes, so wave three is in midst right now. Wave four is predominantly the rest of secondary. So um, they're really in that last wave. Okay, but that's, I just wanted to confirm that it looks, because it looked like we're not just there yet based on the schedule. No, we're not, we're not, can I, we're not finished with uh, wave three, which includes uh, middle school. And once wave three, that'll allow opportunities for a wave four, which includes high school. 
But all those that wanted to get the vaccination should be in those waves, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank about you. 20, we're about 20% 20 of wave three have completed. And again, this is the TriMet area. So it's all our neighboring districts at the same time. But um, what I know is that uh, we're looking at maybe uh, starting um, probably around February the 15th. And it's also dependent right now. We know that um, uh, in this way, uh, our governor also prioritized our seniors getting their um, started. And we also have our child care pro providers that are also uh, getting um, the vaccines as well. Dr. Lisa, just um, I, um, I think my sound when you said uh, the schedule for the wave four, um, just to clarify, you said they're ahead of schedule right now. Is that what you said? Uh, we are we are waiting to complete wave three um, okay. right now. Um, what we've heard that they're only 20 percent in on uh, wave three, which includes middle level uh, staff and support staff. So they're up once wave three completes, then we can start on wave four. But as you see, wave three, we might not even get to finish that by our second week. And that's just one, that's just one dose. Then you have to wait, depending on whether it's uh, um, Moderna or Pfizer, which there's a 21 day with Pfizer after the first dose. And if it's Madrona, there's 28 days from the first dose to the second dose. And then you have to wait two weeks after that. So what I hear saying is that the graph is still pretty accurate as a part as a, where we are with actual immunizations. Yeah. But, yeah, okay. Thank you for that. Cause yes, that vaccinating schedule is definitely driving a lot of just our hard timelines, right? And so um, that is just one thing we're keeping in mind as we plan and as we are you know, ready to expand and we have lists of kids at the ready, um, but we just keep adjusting as that vaccination, vaccination schedule continues to move. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just some photos from today. Um, you see some of our administrators on the bus that rode to welcome and greet uh, our first round of students in limited in-person or limited um, in-person instruction. Um, and we've got some students coming into our brand new Tuolity building, which was really exciting. Um, and then at Fowler as well. Um, so this was, you know, some of that first time experience. And I definitely know those Tuolity students were excited to be some of the, the first students to enter the completed building. So, um, you know, it was exciting to see all the hard work that our administrators have continued to do as well as all their staff um, to continue to pivot and support students. And just wanted to put on here, although we're talking about, you know, a handful of students coming into building, we have had a lot of staff that have been and continue to support our students and families by going to their homes and doing home visits. So that is also a part of our limited in-person work. And I just want to continue to lift and, and bring those staff into, into the space. So big shout out to them and shout out to our schools that launched this week. Next slide. So just some of our next steps uh, when it comes to middle and high, again, waiting for that vaccination. Um, schedule as well as that safe rollout of pre-K-5. But really the problem we are now here to tackle and, and solve is given the ODE guidance and no more than four cohorts, no more than 100 students, as well as following metrics, the advisory metrics, how do we transition to an in-person instructional, social, emotional experience that is least disruptive for students as well as protects their and their family's health? That while we will have our teachers vaccinated, we do have to remember, especially with our high school students that carry the virus more similar to adults, that them as well as their families are mostly not vaccinated. So again, we're just trying to be very thoughtful. And when we know exactly what that timeline is um, and trying to make an educated guess around that, you know, what decisions do we make around that experience and going back to our hybrid plan and how do we adjust that to still be very meaningful for our students and again, least disruptive. So some of the next steps we'll be taking is that uh, we will be having our TGSD secondary collective task force um, 
and it will include folks that have already been helping us all along the way working to revise that hybrid plan based on our new tentative timeline. Um, again, vaccination schedule driving that as well as our safe rollout of pre-K-5 per ODE's guidance, guidance that we can show that we can mitigate risk successfully. As we know, two through five is rolling out around that April 5th timeline. Um, so giving that time to settle and roll and then looking at bringing in our secondary. We'll also be participating on the ESD secondary planning team with our neighboring districts to tap into that broader expertise um, as we're all working to solve this complex problem of what is good for kids, what is good for them instructionally, again, social, emotionally, given the time frame, given the context, and given some of the constraints of the guidance when it comes to how much students can still mix and move about the buildings uh, with the number of students we serve. So again, not starting at ground zero, but really going back to our plan and um, revising it accordingly is our next steps for secondary. So uh, what does what does it look like if we can only have our middle schoolers in four cohorts, if they have seven periods a day, how are we gonna combine classes so that they're in only one cohort for English and social studies or what's the what's the preliminary thinking? And I realize it's all preliminary at this yes. point. But <laughs> I wanna be really clear about that because one thing we believe is very valuable is to continually working alongside our stakeholders. Um, but I think that is where there is a lot of discussion to be had. Um, and do you disrupt the instructional model? Do you stay in CDL? And do you then have other social, emotional, social, et cetera, in-person activities for students? But it's less about moving about the building like a normal school day, because that's just not possible, right? Elementary, it's one room, one, you know, that one classroom model. Uh, middle school had worked to that around the teaming to make that as small as possible. Um, but again, given the timeline of likelihood of when all secondary staff will be vaccinated and the time that's left in the school year, you know, what do we do really well? There are aspects of this that is working and there's an in-person aspect that's needed. And we know that, and we want to be really thoughtful about what those pieces are and not just disrupting all of it just to say, Hey, let's figure out how to just get back because getting back and then maybe two days later, shutting down for 14 days and pivoting home. What we don't want is, Oh, wait shift to this schedule, shift to this kind of learning now, right? Uh, students need as seamless as possible. And so all along we had talked about online being the really the hub of how students were going to learn in case we had to pivot and you had to go home, it would not disrupt your instruction. You know, our staff are working so hard and you know, I know many that have just, I've got this now, I've got this way that I can engage kids. I'm making it work. Would I do this forever in this mode? No. But I finally got a rhythm now, right? We have to remember teachers have pivoted so many times and we are now just getting, you know, in that rhythm and routines that folks are getting used to. We had a whole new flip of schedule at middle school that is actually working for a lot of students. So again, how do we complement what is working as opposed to just throwing the whole baby out um, just to say, hey, we're back in hybrid, right? So again, we're just wanting to be really thoughtful about that. Yeah. Uh, Director Fields or um, Dr. Sue, uh, just wanted to clarify, um, I know we've been working closely with our neighbors, uh, Beaverton School District, Hillsboro, and it sounded in uh, public comment that their um, alignment um, or their plans for secondary um, are different or just wanted clarification if that's possible from both of you or yeah. one of Director um, uh, Wolf, I, I want to read from a communication that went directly from Beaverton School District to parents. Uh, and it basically says uh, under the middle school, high school, and option school, they, they speak about a BSD connect. Um, and what it states is that they are looking to start that on April 19th, the first day of the fourth quarter, so the last nine weeks. Um, that will be for middle, high school, and option schools if the metrics can get there. Um, and what they will be doing is talking about me keeping students online for their, their basic instruction. So that model is not disrupted. At the same time, bringing in students by specific groups, such as AVID, clubs, community service, specific course activities and specific social activities. Um, while students remain in CDL for their academic classes. This is directly from a communication that came from BSD. So I think that's part of the confusion is our districts talking about limited in-person and then a different form of hybrid. And this is the reason to Director Fields' point relative to the ESD 
Washington, uh, in Washington County, uh, Beaverton um, District, uh, Hillsborough School District, our district, Forest Grove and Sherwood will be coming together to try to thread the needle relative to this, this connect concept, because we it is challenging as Director Zurchmead has already alluded to, as well as Director Fields, uh, to get to any kind of a quote unquote normal in-person schedule when you are limited by 100 students, no more than 100 interactions and four cohorts. Uh, and so the belief is, is that you bring all of these great minds who have done years worth of work in terms of master schedules and movement of students together um, and really fully flush out this, this connect idea. And I think that is the direction that this team is going to go. I have, a, I have a question I think is kind of aligned to this or maybe completely aligned to this. I don't know. Um, so sports, students participating in sports are not considered part of a cohort. Correct. So, connected. so, so A, I know it's not technically lippy, but if, if our drama students or our choir students or our affinity group students want to come together and meet, um, and, they, and there's teacher volunteers um, or district staff volunteers who, who wanted to do that. What, are the, what is the possibility of that kind of an arrangement and what would the implications be for, for the instructional model? I would give the overarching and I'll let Director Fields give it the perhaps more detail, but I think there, there are two pieces here. The constraint around Lippy is that it is, if you were say, calling it a limited in-person, you can only have, you can have no more than 20 students for no more that, uh, than two hours. And that's where we are starting now simply because we have volunteer staff. We don't have enough staff yet to fully flush out this direction relative to, the, to what Beaverton is calling BSD Connect this concept of what you're describing around affinity groups, Director Bowman, where you would have the opportunity to come in for longer periods of time. And we would refile and re redevelop the hybrid plan and refile it with ODE that says, we're bringing them in by these groups for this reason for extended periods during the day to augment what they are receiving online. Uh, but it's not limited in person in terms of having to stay constrained within the two. Use your 100 for that type of grouping versus the, the limited in person 20. We have to start with the limited in person simply because of we are, we are constrained by, by personnel. So um, is there, I guess what I'm wondering is if, if we did it in the evenings, for example, and it was totally disconnected from the instructional model, um, there's no... <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and, and Director Bowman. Yeah, uh, go ahead, and Director Fields. But no, I, yes, you are you are now untying the Gordian knot that we've been trying to untie with 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 ODE guidance. You have to be very thoughtful and careful that you are following because again, remember our our district's liability is also tied directly to the to the guidance, um, and so we have to be really thoughtful about how we do that. If we're calling it evening, if the evening opportunity is relative to instruction, that's an instructional cohort. Well, so I get, let me clarify, I guess. So sports are not instructional. Um, historically, drama club is not instructional unless you're taking drama class. Um, newspaper is not instructional. These sort of like, what, what we're hearing from students and parents is like the, the, the social and mental health deficiencies are, are some of the larger concerns. So I'm, I guess I'm just, you know, OSAA has said, these things are okay and don't count towards cohorting and are sort of exempted from your rules. Do we know if there's another body that's exempted or we or we don't know yet? Don't know. Okay. Yeah. And, and I would say, I, I would say I would absolutely, we would point in the direction back up to, um, uh, to ODE and ask the question. My guess is he, what they would say, you're either going to call it hybrid and you're going to develop your plan that way, you're going to call it limited in person. OSAA, because it's an independent body, stands alone. And so they've been able to, you know, get their tea leaves to split, if you will, so that they can stand alone from instruction. But the good news is when we get there, yes, we can do that kind of work. Right now, because we have, you know, there's only so much capacity, we've got to start with the kids that aren't connected and successful and engaging in CDL, just because we've got to work from the highest priority and need kind of, you know, down the, down the list. Um, not that those are any less important. It's just where we have to put our resource right now. But when we get there, and that's kind of, again, part of that conversation for, when we are able to come back once everyone's vaccinated, 
those are absolutely, when you hear that BSD connect, those are the kind of things that would accompany CDL instruction. So hopefully we'll and get there. Also to, to Director Fields's point, um, when, we, when we look to some of our, our neighboring districts that have smaller populations, such as Lake Oswego, Westland, Wilsonville, uh, even Sherwood, um, they, are, they are able to be a bit more facile because they have fewer numbers. Um, the, as I've shared many times before, TTSD is blessed, um, as well as in that awkward sweet spot where we are small enough as a community that we care very deeply about our schools, but very large, but large enough that we have these constraints relative to banging up against the limits of 104 cohorts that other districts that are smaller than us, um, significantly smaller, do not have, have as great a, a struggle with. And that is something also in the in the Beaverton's um, recent communication that they highlighted. So um, given what you just told us, um, which is helpful, would it be reasonable to assume that um, we would start with some kind of um, what we call it connect or hybrid or secondary mid April sometime? Would that be a given that we're partnering with other districts and other districts have indicated mid-April. Is that a reasonable assumption or, or are we just not there yet? I think we're not there. I want to be really careful about throwing out a hard timeline because I think we're all looking for anything concrete in this just day and age. Um, and because again, we are at the mercy of the vaccine schedule for our waves three and four for secondary. But I think it, roughly, you know, that mid to end of April would probably be when our guidance starts to shift. And if we go in that direction of a connect, think of it as Lippy plus our CDL but we would be able to expand, you know, not be constrained to two hours, not be constrained to just a smaller amount of groups, et cetera. That whole process could expand much greater. And Director Fox, I would also share with you that both uh, Superintendent Grotting, myself and, and Superintendent Scott from Hillsboro uh, continue to advocate uh, to the governor's office directly relative to um, allowing ODE to Re revise the metrics relative to the four cohorts and 100, and 100 students. It really is extraordinarily trying. And I sympathize with all of the parents of middle schoolers and high schoolers who see everything that's being done for the elementary uh, school kids. You know, I've talked to so many elementary school parents who are so grateful that we have a timeline. We have a pretty good idea of what our date is to be back in the building. And I know that that's, that's something that's really helpful to have a plan that you could kind of like, okay, it might swish a little bit, but we've got a, we've got a number. Um, and so I, I totally understand why the middle school and high school parents are so um, anxious to get that same, that same thing to grab onto. And it's just that there's so much still up in the air for that for that group and how to make that work. Um, but I want, I want those parents to know that their, their cries are not unheard and not, not, I, I'm very sympathetic to them. And I think one thing we're trying to really avoid is saying, all right, it's gonna be April 15th. And then, oh, darn it, the vaccinations were held up. We didn't get as many. Oh, we're pushing a week, push a week, push a week, right? And I'm a parent as well, and that's been really hard. So I, I sympathize as well. And I also recognize that change of timeline is also really difficult as well. And we're trying to not do that and to make some really educated and thoughtful, you know, benchmark of timelines, given the information we have as we get it. So. So I know we jumped in. Um, Amber with a bunch of questions. So I um, don't know if there was additional slides for you and Dr. McCall that you wanted to um, wrap up with. That was the last slide, I believe, but we did uh, want to be available to answer any questions you have. And so uh, again, we, we thought we would be almost done with wave three, but again, that's, we're not. And uh, hopefully we'll start back soon. I'm wondering if we could develop some kind of like simplified version of um, so of like this presentation just for students piece that we can like put in that we can talk about during advisory just to keep us updated because I know we have like so many pieces of information and we get like I don't know like sometimes different things from our teachers and so it like 
because I know we send messages on Canvas or if we just had some sort of graphic to keep like our students um, in the know, that would be, I feel like that would be really great. And yeah. That's a great idea, Emily. Thank you for wanting to add that layer of communication. Um, so I'm sure that Director Rose or someone will be in connection with you guys to get you set up for that. So thank you. Um, so being mindful of the time, it's 8.56. Um, so I think that we'll go ahead and move uh, 